Hello, and welcome to the Center for Critical and Cultural Theory. My name is Dr. Roger Green. This is going to be lecture two in our spring semester 2024 class introduction to critical theory. Our first lecture dealt with an essay that uh, Herbert Marcuse had written in the late 30s. And now we're going to go back into the late 1700s, early 1800s to do some ground laying work um, for understanding um, where Marx and dialectical materialism comes from. And what we're going to be dealing with is this group of philosophers um, uh, called the Young Hegelians, um, a group that um, the young Karl Marx was definitely affiliated with. Um, but before then, we're going to go into some just some very, very general and very brief for, for how complicated the philosophy is. Um, uh, we're going to do some brief coverage of Hegel and um, the idealists and the milieu that he comes from that sets the stage for Marx and the young Hegelians here. Um, obviously, you will want to dig more into that period, and I won't be able to do um, uh, a, a thinker like Hegel is so huge and wrote so much stuff. There's, it's, it, it will be pretty limited for um, what I can expose us to today. It's more of a cultural history. Um, I'm going to pull up my document here. And if, as usual, I will mostly read from the document. It's um, available for accessibility purposes as I maneuver through this, unless you're listening to this in podcast form. Um, and I will step out of my written lecture. Um, but the, the written lecture kind of keeps me on track and um, gives me a beginning and an ending. So I'm going to share my screen here with you all. And um, make sure volume look working OK. Just going to turn up a little bit. OK. okay. Um, so you may be encountering this class as part of um, uh, a college campus or a university class, um, uh, you also might be just watching this on YouTube or um, uh, listening in from my Patreon page. If you are out in the world and you are not paying for this class through a university, please consider supporting us on Patreon uh, if you feel so moved for this content, because it is very much a labor of love. I'm working as an adjunct or a part-time professor at various different places, and the money is not good. Um, and, and all of the the help I can get, I, <laughs> I suppose, for doing this complex um, thought work. So um, um, one other caveat before I get going here. I've compiled these notes from several different lectures and things that I've, I've watched, whether it was classes that I took myself in school. Um, I feel like a lot of this came from um, various... Um, great courses or great courses plus lectures which is like a a media center where you can get professors um commenting on things and and um as i'm taking the notes over the years and, and remixing them in different places um you might uh I, I might be um spouting or or using the organizational um uh principles that other uh thinkers have used too but it's it's uh, sort of general public knowledge at, at the same time so i'm not always necessarily citing the other lecturers that i've gotten some of my stuff from um but but i do feel like the great courses plus is a really good resource for for people and that's probably where i got some of this um some of this stuff and then of course i add in my own stuff and 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 build from there um this is kind of what scholars do mm. Um, I'm not taking any like really, really particular idea um, from from somebody who's giving a history of something and um, uh, not attributing it to them, but but uh, um, we don't cite every single lecture that we went to. Um, okay, jumping in. In order to understand Marx's thesis on Feuerbach, which is one of our first readings for our course this week, after Marcuse, we have Theses on Feuerbach and then the Communist Manifesto. In order to understand these, it's going to be necessary to gloss a brief history of the philosophical milieu in which he came of age. While young, Marx joined a circle known as the Young Hegelians, sometimes called the Left Hegelians. They read Hegel's philosophy of history as superseding Christianity in Western culture by emphasizing a materialist critique of Hegelian idealism. 
In the historical gloss that follows, I want to situate Hegelian thought and its context as a reaction to the Enlightenment thought um, of and to uh, Immanuel Kant in particular, who, um, although working in the eastern part of Prussia in, in um, a town that's located in Russia today, Kant famously did not travel much more than 20 miles outside of the radius of that town his whole life. But um, uh, despite him being so far east, and we generally think of the Enlightenment as as happening in the West, and as particularly in France and, and in England, uh, and as I get to talking about what was Germany at this time, or Prussia, there, there is no state of Germany during this period, right? Um, uh, in the 19th century, we get the Prussian Empire um, uh, and, and, and there are earlier versions of it as well. Uh, as I said, that's where Kant is coming from. Um, it is because of the Enlightenment interest um, that, that people begin reading Immanuel Kant right away. Um, like there's already reading gr groups and circles dedicated to his, his work within a few years um, after some of his texts come out and, and within his a few years after his death. And the same thing has happened to Hegel at this point, right, where we get the young Hegelians. Hegel dies in 1831. Marx is um, but a teenager <laughs> at that point in time. But he, um, uh, um, Feuerbach, Ludwig Feuerbach, who we are, we will discuss um, a bit today, uh, definitely was a student of Hegel's at University of Berlin. And, and um, because Marx ends up going to University of Berlin, um, after having a break with his father about studying law, um, uh, Marx wants to study literature and philosophy. Um, he moves to Berlin, and Berlin had been where Hegel had been. It's also where this guy who I'm not talking about today named um, Schleiermacher is a really important influence on the way some of these people will be talking about religion um, as well, and particularly, particularly the Christian religion um, and theology. Uh, and so we're just not talking about him, but I, he's a really important figure in, in uh, um, religious studies, which is one of my degrees. Um, so, yeah, and what follows, I want to situate Hegelian thought in its context from the Enlightenment and Immanuel Kant. Um, uh, Hegel's movement, sometimes known as, uh, oftentimes known as idealism, but it's also German romanticism. So you want to understand romanticism as a kind of reaction to the enlightenment of the 1700s. So we'll jump in the background here. In the late 18th century, in the 1700s, right, the French Revolution changed European politics, culture, and society. European philosophers became hopeful of a new freedom. They were driven by a central question, is is, is, is it possible to turn the tables on the scientific naturalism, matter and motion inherited from the 17th century, and found a metaphys metaphysics on the freedom of the human mind that includes unfree deterministic nature as part of it? I'm going to ask that question again just because it's really, really loaded. Is it possible to turn the tables on the scientific naturalism matter and motion inherited from the 17th century and found a metaphysics on the freedom of the human mind that includes unfree deterministic nature as part of it. So you want to think about earlier breakthroughs presented by like Newtonian physics. That's what the question means by matter and motion, right, in the 17th century. Enlightenment science and modernism was especially associated with France and England um, rather than being beginning with questions of metaphysics or what is the nature of reality first and then inserting the human in it, these modernist philosophers put self at the center and regarded nature as developing out of the self, especially in the thought of Immanuel Kant, who lived from 1724 to 1804. This was partly the influence of a skeptical tradition that emphasized knowledge as emerging from human cognition and concepts. In broader philosophy, this is known as the mind-body pro problem. Um, German philosophers such as Johann Gottlieb Fichte and Friedrich Wilhelm Joseph von Schelling and Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel were developing their own take on all of this after Kant um, 
This is burgeoning idealism. Now, what is really important, and I will not be able to cover it and do justice, is what I really want to emphasize here is the idea of nature being subordinated to the human mind itself. This is a big and complex discussion that's going on. Um, it very much ties into um, uh, ways that these Euro-Christian thinkers, as I will call them, even though Marx comes from a Jewish background, he's wor working in a Euro-Christian philosophical tradition. Um, uh, the way that European thought dealt with and conceived of nature had a lot to do with the ways that colonization occurred. Um, and current current critical theory in my work with indigenous scholars like Tink Tinker um, were very critical of the ways that Euro Christians, um, even just general Euro Christians today, um, tend to use an abstract version of capital and nature as this thing. Like I've got to go and get out into nature and go to the mountains, like as if I'm not in nature right now, sitting in my cold apartment in winter time. Um, uh, and this becomes a big a difference between indigenous and Euro-Christian worldview. That is part of my ongoing scholarship, but that's not part of this lecture. I just want to make sure that I draw attention to this as we think about um, much of this discussion in the background is about thinking about what nature is and what these Western Euro-Christian philosophers have generally done is they've um, created this thing I will call the subjective turn. Um, where we go inwards, where we're thinking about philosophy of mind and epistemology and how cognition and logic works in the so-called age of reason. So car carrying on here, German Enlightenment thinkers admired and envied French and English, but felt inferior and threatened by the apparent secularism and scientism of the West. So Germany is the East in this time. It's like, that's an important thing as well, right? Like, because um, that border of East, West um, moves and fluctuates through different political periods in history. Um, uh, the German Enlightenment wished to confront English and French and Dutch skepticism by combining faith and reason. However, there was also at the time period, a Renaissance, a Spinoza Renaissance going on in Germany. So Spinoza, who's a Jewish thinker, um, lived from 1632 to 1677, um, uh, was read as a rational determinist atheist um, or rational deterministic atheist who um, forced those opposing him, who opposed him to opt for either faith um, and forget about reason. Um, or um, what if there's another way, right? So the discussion that's going on is like, are you going to follow Spinoza, the Jewish atheist, um, and his way of thinking, um, or 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 are you going to opt for faith, which is a way of opting for non-reason, right? So so uh, Spinoza was really powerful. Um, dispelled a lot of people's um, sort of dogmatic beliefs about religion. Um, got himself into trouble with his own communities of Jewish people um, and and was a force to be reckoned with. Um, and so part of the project here in terms of philosophy is, is, is there a way to think about faith that can sort of uh, be in harmony with our idea of reason? This is part of what I think distinguishes the German Enlightenment context and philosophy from uh, the philosophies further west and, and across the channel in England. Um, so Germany had been heir to mystical pietism, a quasi-mystical version of Christianity mixing with Platonism, with pietism of Meister Eckhart, who's a late medieval um, scholar, and there should be a dash in there, uh, and Jakob Bohm, uh, a more of a Renaissance period or early modern period scholar. Um, so this was part of the tradition in Germany. And then of course, we also have the Protestant Reformation going on in Germany, right? So um, this tradition was pantheistic. It was the idea of that I am God from Meister Eckhart, that God is infused in everything. This would give German philosophers a particular attention to nature as a concept, nature as the unfolding of God, perhaps nature as creation itself. Um, what distinguishes God from creation, 
um, well, not a whole lot if we're saying that I am God myself too, right? That somehow I am part and parcel of God. Um, so in this thought, the primordial spirit of dark of God is a dark and inchoate idea of will moving towards self-realization. God develops and changes over time. God moves from a state of lack of self-awareness, um, I should say, to complete it's to complete self. So again, God develops and changes over time. God moves from a state of lack of self-awareness to complete self. Creation serves the progressive self-recognition of God through recognizing himself against the opposition of his creation. Creation exists so that God can know who God is in this line of thinking. The Christian God needs the creation to un to understand itself, um, his self, herself, whatever, God self, in relation to creation. So the Trinity was regarded as the stages of development in this way. Um, uh, one can see rather quickly that God will be tied to the unfolding of time and history in this tradition. Um, uh, so we need to like situate the, these philosophers. This is why, like, again, I always use this term Euro Christian, right there. And, and this goes on through all of the philosophy of this early modern period, whether we're talking about French, whether we're talking about English, um, like if you go back and you read, um, uh, your Thomas Hobbes, if you go back and you read your John Locke, what they're really, really talking about over and over again are things like the soul and the nature of the soul. But we live in a time period where that has de-emphasized that Christian discussion, that it is the thing that is most at stake <laughs> historically for these people. Um, uh, so, so the Germans are trying to work this out and they're working it out with a really complex and unique um, kind of theology um, uh, backing, backing their, their, their thought. Um, these are largely Protestant derived um, uh, Christians, but not necessarily all of them. There are certainly Catholicism maintains um, a place as well. So the French Revolution deeply affected Germans. In the beginning, there was an inspiration to, to great equality, but then the terror killed tens of thousands, and then Napoleon arose as a tyrant, right? So you go from like thinking, oh, this French Revolution happened, it's going to be great for everybody, and then what we get is um, a tyrant. So Napoleon, um, sorry for the spelling there, um, Napoleon's conquest developed into modern the modern concept of nationalism, um, a retreat to nation states. Now we could look back and we could say, no, that's the 1648 piece of Westphalia. That's another place that we could look back to the foundation of nation states. Um, but we really get with the beheading of the king, um, uh, the uh, the destruction of the idea of the divine rights of kings, uh, this new kind of modern sort of concept of governance called the nation state. Um, so this is a modern national spirit and culture that developed among German intellectuals in response to French domination. We can think of this like with the classic fairy tales this is a good way to think of this from a literary angle, right? Um, in the early 1800s, brothers Grimm are collecting the folk tales. Charles Perrault in France is collecting folk tales of the areas. Um, and trying to decide what constitutes a people over even in the colonies, right? Um, and in the what be, has recently become the United States, um, we get Washington Irving and the legend of Sleepy Hollow and Rip Van Winkle and all of that sort of stuff. That is all part of the romantic movement that is attaching itself to an idea of landed nationalism, right? Within a particular kind of border system. Now, uh, this will become important, especially for Marx and for Marx's own family, as we get down to to talking about him. But um, we'll we'll see that in a little bit. So Kant during the um, during the seventeen hundreds had shown the way to find the origin of mechanistic scientific nature of the human in free self and spirit. That's partly what his philosophy was about. For Kant. The mind is active instead of passive. The mind creates its own rules by which it organizes 
experience. The self is powerful and free. The individual rational human being gained political authority and the powers that that be must take a, into account the freedom of the individual. Again, this new nation state governance needs to understand that it serves and that whatever it's population is right so and how does it take the individuals and its population seriously so this is partly why some people trace human rights traditions back to kant we could go back to earlier notions like in aquinas for example um for ideas of of again another discussion of nature going on there but um in terms of the united nations and the universal declaration of human rights Many people trace some of these ideas back to Kant and his idea of freedom. So Kant remains important. He's a complex, very difficult philosopher to read at times. Um, um, but that's what, at least one of the reasons why his legacy remains important. Um, so for younger thinkers, a comprehensive philosophy based on, in freedom of self could both incorporate the new sciences and reconcile it with the German Christian tradition of political freedom. This would be uniquely German. In the new society, the enlightened human thinks. Fichte, um, one of these young idealists, um, critiqued all revelation in 1792. Um, this is echoed in Schopenhauer, but this, is, if we go back to that idea of Spinoza, um, he would be drawing on Spinoza, right? The critique of all revelation and the political theological treatise by right? Spinoza. One of the points that Spinoza makes is that we are not anymore in the time of miracles there might have been miracles from god in the past where god intervened in human society but we are no longer in that right um and so we are th this is a, the critique of revelation um becomes a really important part of of the way that these uh, thinkers are characterizing their christianity and history so uh fichte made uh, also made addresses to the german nation so we see in the thinkers that they are imagining something like a a, a german nation so we're seeing the, the the beginnings of nationalism here um he turned kant into absolute idealism and this thought appearance alone cannot be right he argued that it cannot be the case that there was something outside of the mind the self thus posits itself as finite and it's not self or nature without which it cannot know what it is. The action of self-positing comes before knowledge. There are not things in themselves. The self is not solipsistic, though. The self's first act is to posit the not self in order to know what it is. Action comes before asserting its own being against that which it is not. This is a kind of othering. And we kind of saw it with my account of the way that they were thinking about God above, right? So we've gone from God to humans. <laughs> and they're talking about the cognitive process. They're talking about logic and how logic works and how we know what we know. Um, this is why for Kant, sometimes people, they, 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 they he he was a deeply Christian pietist person, but they wouldn't let Kant, they, they stopped letting Kant teach theology classes and at the university where he lectured because um, his his thinking um, uh, basically kind of draws us to a place where we can't really say anything about God, right? Because we can't really know God as God in itself, because all we can know is the in itself of our own minds and our ideas about God. Um, and so uh, uh, that didn't jive well with some of the other Christians at the time period, but I don't want to characterize Kant as not Christian. He is definitely a super Christian guy. They just stopped letting him teach theology classes. Um, uh, in this view, then in Fichte's view, um, we have direct non-empirical intuition of a simultaneously thinking and willing subject constrained by the world. The non-empirical of emphasis was an implicit critique of English philosophy, which you know, empirical like puts says that nature is out here first, and we need to understand it through our relationships with it um, through experimentation and objective science and all of that sort of stuff. The German tradition is going to critique that by saying that the only we must the only way that we encounter the world is through 
um, the synthetic judgments that are already going on in our minds. Um, so in German um, philosophy, uh, um, the self is the source of all things, but the self as a source is also dynamic. It posits self and opposite and is a thinking and willing subject. The self must be a part of the absolute spirit and God because the self itself is limited. You might hear echoes of Rene Descartes' meditations on first philosophy here. That they're definitely appropriate if you're if you're thinking of that. <laughs> Humans must be posited by the self positing God. Create because the God is the infinite thing that's outside of ourselves that we cannot know, right? Humans must be posited by the self-positing God. Creation is God point positing God's self or itself as a series of limited selves, each constrained by the not self or nature. So again, um, Christian ideas of the imago or the image of God um, might be appropriate to be thinking about here. But in any sense, we are all um, as individuals part of God coming to to God's own awareness of what God's self is. And we mimic in our own minds the same sort of process of positing things outside of ourselves so that we can understand what we are by distinguishing ourselves from what we are not. Speculative philosophy or idealism of this period says that the self posits both itself and nature as sourced by the self. And then the two interact. All is a process by which spirit actively creates itself and its opposite nature. So then we start getting this materialist account of nature, but that somehow humans or human spirit, the mind or the soul is something different, is something ethereal, is something literally spiritual and, and not substantive. Um, so philosophy then needs to recognize the opposites as expression. Um, the opposite as the expression. Nature in this line of thinking, nature, that which constrains me, that's what 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 gets a border to me is like it's like the thing that's outside of myself is nature, right? The thing that I sometimes I need to go dip back into nature when I go to the mountains, right? This is that Euro Christian way of thinking. Nature, that which constrains me, is in a deeper sense my own product, the product of the divine inner self in me, positing both itself and its object, me. Thus, Schelling attempted to reform Spinoza's pantheism, which had tried had to be reconciled with the freedom in the German tradition and the problem of evil, or theodicy is what we call that project in philosophy. Schelling says the absolute spirit over time divides itself into nature and mind in order to know itself. Even God doesn't understand himself until he goes through a process of positing and developing and splitting. We are all a part of this great drama and their self-recognition of the absolute spirit. Schelling said nature is the creative source of the mind and retained a, an Aristotelian kind of biology. God must be alive, self-developing, a coming to completion. He says Spinoza was wrong because he was too fixed. God's essence or reality is distinct from God's basis, even though the performer derives from the latter because nothing is outside of God. God must have a primitive and fundamental base out, out of which God comes. Schelling says that in the earliest phase, God is the unground or chaos or dark energy before any grounding or distinction. One can think of the actual Hebrew translations, right, of the, the of, of Genesis and what the Christians call the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible. Um, the, 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 there is disorder out there, but it's not that the, the, it's not um, creation doesn't have an ex nihilo, doesn't out of nothing. That's not an idea that's in the Hebrew Bible, right? It's a later idea that comes in. So um, we can see that Schelling is, is drawing on some theology here. Um, <clears throat> God is the unground or chaos or dark energy before any grounding or distinction. God longed to give birth to himself, causing essence and ground to come become differentiated from each other. God, 
ground then becomes nature actualized and essence becomes spirit actualized. Humans are an actualization of both as both. So in this tradition of thought, evil occurs when the ground or the nature escapes the control of spirit and acts upon it. The only This only happens in humans, though. Love is the proper reintegration of the essence and the ground. When you think about like early colonists that <laughs> are wanting to control nature, or t- ties to the land and that, that kind of stuff, or somebody like John Locke over in England, it's, it's a different, a bit of a different theology, but he's also a Euro-Christian, right? And his concept of um, the labor theory of property is that it only <clears throat> land only becomes useful when it becomes transferred into property. Um, that reconciliation of nature outside of myself and my spirit is the Christian thing. It's the fused thing. <laughs> um, it's what the Euro Christians are supposed to be doing in the world, at least according to this th- this kind of theology. So love, what the, this is interesting, that love is the name that's given to this, the proper reintegration of essence and ground, the fusing of spirit actualized and nature physical nature actualized. Contemporary Christian systematic theologians, like way into now, um, such as Catherine Keller, I feel like um, she has a book called Political Theology of the Earth. And, and, and I think that she's building on some of these ideas, right? So so these, these ideas might seem really weird for you if you've never studied anything about religion, um, but th- they're definitely out there and, and worth thinking about. And they're also very different than indigenous worldview. Right. And 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 they infuse for those of us who come from Euro Christian traditions, right? So like my my being a Euro Christian, um, as a Roger the Euro Christian is it has nothing to do with like a kind of faith in God. I don't go to church or any of that kind of stuff, but I'm informed and encultured into uh a uh uh language and a culture that um has so much of this stuff in its background that it comes out in the ways that I form my words and sometimes form my ideas. And I need to sort of keep that in check um, if I'm going to to, to um, uh, be critical of the Christianity thing. So it's, it's not, it's not just a rejection of Christianity either. Right. It's like, it's like, no, how, how do I understand my own thinking and my own words and understand when my own concepts of the world have come from these concepts that might be considered theological or mystical or whatever they are at their base, right? That becomes the task of self-interrogation for someone like me. Um, So back to the lecture though. Um, Hegel, so some of these ideas exist with people like Catherine Keller today or in the the realm of systematic theology. Hegel had trouble with um, Schelling um, and um, Hegel thought that Schelling was too mystical and too romantic. Um, But the key thing for our lecture today is that God and everything else is always evolving and developing in this tradition. I think that's not like the way that people normally think about God, unless they've like been going to a particular theological situation where we see that, that, that the creation is God coming to know God's own self. Um, So this is all well before Darwin, the idealists, um, thought that with an evolutionary account of nature, we could, we could give an account of God and religion and ethics. This sets the stage for Hegel's conception of history. Hegel approached modernity from the Christian tradition. He was concerned with the meaning of Christianity in light of the Enlightenment, and Hegel asks, quote, well, not quote, but in bold, <laughs> Um, can we create a truly systematic philosophy of everything based on the pantheistic or panentheistic spirit that does not exclude the reality of human history? As mentioned above, the German Enlightenment was also concerned with the reinvention of German culture through education because the East, which is what Germany was at this point in time, uh, because the East had very little political power against France. 
again, a Germanic alternative to Western Enlightenment would combine Christian piety and rationalism. There's a communitarian element to German philosophy, a traditionalism that is allergic to Western capitalism. Uh, in the phenomenology of spirit, Hegel wants wanted to analyze the shapes and forms of geist or spirit or mind as they evolve in human history from the most limited to the whole, which would be God. Human history maps God's own evolution, becoming aware of itself. Insight, insight is developed through comprehensive looking at human development. Dialectic is the name that Hegel gives to the manner of transition or development here. Now, this isn't to say that we don't have dialectical thinking going on way back with Plato, right? It's just that it's taken on a completely um, more particularized form in the German um, Enlightenment and in a German Romantic or idealist philosophy. Um, one thing, and the, the the big thing is is Christianity, right? Because like Plato, Christianity doesn't exist at the time of Plato. Um, Hegel, of course, if you read the Phenomenology of Spirit, um, uh, has this kind of evolutionary account of um, the Greeks and how um, the pre-Christian sort of figure into all of this. And um, he deals this, with this particularly with um, a reading of Antigone, um, the Greek tragedy by Sophocles as well. So I'm just throwing that in there because um, we might come back to tragedy a little bit later on with modern literature. Um, in dialectical thought or Hegelian dialectical thought, progress moves through thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. Conflict leads to an integration at, an high, at a higher level. Um, everything must imply its opposite. Limitation is established through negation and followed by incorporation. Remember, this is what I just described above with Schelling and with Christianity of this period as the process of love, as the process of synthesizing and actualizing not just spirit as an intangible thing, but nature as a tangible and material thing. Um, we come to know ourselves by distinguishing ourselves from nature um, and then reconciling it. <clears throat> Hegel uses the term begriff or notion, I, I put it as a capital N because um, the Germans uh, put nouns in all capitals. Um, this is the thing's truth. Um, so Hegel uses the term begriff or notion to name this process. He's naming an entire process. It's important to emphasize that this is dynamic. Normally, our ideas of things are perceived statically. It's like that chair over in the other side of the room. But since everything is always also always in the process of developing, the notion is a viewpoint of a thing in its fullness of development of developmental evolution incorporated into the whole. Any truth of a part is only local. Hegel's geist or spirit, as it's often translated, is being in and for itself. And his vernuft or his word, word for reason with a capital R is opposed to Kant's mere reflection. It's an important distinction between enlightenment uh, philosophy of Kant and Hegel's um, idea of reason here um, because, and again, I think this is because of like Hegel is trying more actively to integrate this with a Christian pietism, pietist tradition. It's not to say that Kant is not Christian himself too, right? Um, it's just part of the project of the idealists. Hegel says that reason, not understanding, is trying to recognize something in its evolution to its whole. It's not just understanding something, it's seeing the object that I'm looking at in a bigger process of a whole that's progressing. This produces a new theory of truth, which more typically means correspondence between the statement and the things described. Hegel wants a different theory coherence, fitting the idea into the whole of reality. For Hegel, sense certainty is not complete and abstract. The concrete content I sense in the object, um, the, sorry, the concrete content I sense is in the object. But in language, even the most concrete words 
are abstractions whose truth can only be found in the whole. The object can be cannot be understood without a force of understanding. We're going to come back to that later on in lectures. We're going to come back to that at the end of the course with this um, important essay by Jacques Derrida called Force of Law. So I just want to draw your attention. This is why I put it in bold right here at the beginning. Um, uh, attention to this idea of force, what drives things. If we were thinking about Machiavelli, which we could easily do along, along these lines, um, the force is, is we're too, right? Um, virtue um, comes into this as well in action. So uh, the object for Hegel cannot be understood without the force of understanding. The understanding of anything would drive us ultimately to the consciousness of God. Hegel says that self-consciousness can only be realized through the interaction with another self-consciousness. He bases this on a view of history. In the ancient world, and this is the famous master-slave dialectic in Hegel, in the ancient world, lord or master and slave do not have self-consciousness. They had an unhappy consciousness. Gradual revolutions progressed toward the ability to attain human freedom. Christianity, then, is the product of overcoming the master and the slave. This is why for these people, even for Ludwig Feuerbach, Christianity is, the, the, for them, the most rational religion. It is. It has evolved that way over time. And we can look back on that and be like, that's totally ethnocentric and culturalist or whatever we want to, charges we want to throw at that sort of thing. But the way that they're characterizing that world history here is that they're saying that Christianity comes and it serves this function in the stages of evolution and progress. Um, so it is certainly not a, exactly a, a critique of Christianity. Even when we get to Feuerbach, it's not enough to just say, that he's critiquing Christianity and the essence of Christianity. Um, Christianity is the product of the overcoming of the master and the slave, according to Hegel. In this dialectic, the slave recognizes himself by recognizing his own potential freedom from the master, which actually makes him equal to the master. The master is then having to actually deal with the slave. They realize each other's self conscious they realize each other's self-consciousness through the external cross of Christianity. This is what Hegel means is that like, you need to have an, a, another person <laughs> to be in dialogue with. And that person is going to have to be your equal. It can't just be your slave that you're objectifying. Um, uh, and through that process, then, then we get to um, the externalization and, and relationships that might um, uh, be what he calls love. Through ethical and cultural objectification, reason masters nature. In the modern age, when humans work through science, commerce, and progress, Western humanity can control nature. Things are not foreign, but part of our spirit. Reason makes itself the master of history, but only in the abstract. The French and American revolutions were only abstract for Hegel. Only abstract freedom results in the violence and the terror. True freedom is yet to be realized. Again, this is more thing about Hegel <laughs> writing in the early 1800s, right? Um, that material fulfillment would involve multiple parts. Um, mor moralitate or moral duties, dictate, um, universal morals, and sitlikite. Um, custom morally embedded rules of the community. Um, the concrete and the conceptual must merge for Hegel. The ideal and the real are connected. Thinkers like Herbert Spencer um, will take this idea um, into ideas of survival of the fittest, which often gets misattributed to Darwin. Um, but that um, idea would then be mapped into English empiricism and Darwinian thought. The bigger Euro-Christian conception here is that progress is only made through dialectical tension and resolution. Okay, I'm going to end <laughs> um, a little bit there, thinking about uh, thinking, taking a pause to think about Hegel. Um, what I want to draw our attention to is that if we're going to go with the young Hegelians like Marx and Feuerbach, um, Hegel has already sort of pointed us 
in the direction of saying that, that there needs to be some sort of realization of these abstract concepts. The French and American revolutions are only abstract. There's going to need to be something else. So Hegel has already predicted in his own philosophy, the coming of something else. And the young Hegelians take that and they attach it to their leftist political philosophy. And, and, and um, we will see a little bit more with them. I have uh, th this image is easily findable on Google. If you just do a Google image search for Hegel's dialectic um, or Hegel's concept of history. And this is how he sees history moving from like, he sees that as linear. This is very Euro-Christian of him, um, but linear. Um, we have a thesis and an antithesis, right? We have um, that process of negation by which I distinguish, like I know myself from what I, I separate my say is outside of myself, right? So me versus nature. Overcoming nature then um, ends up in the process the, of the negation of negation or the thesis the, through thesis and antithesis synthesize. And then we start again and there's this kind of like cellular almost division kind of thing, thing that he's thinking about. Um, and um, so new antithesis arises and then uh, through that kind of conflict, there's synthesis and then synth and then um, uh, we keep moving on and he believes that throughout time um, that's how progress works in history so we start with things inchoate even god starts as inchoate and then um we move towards sense certainty towards perception and eventually towards force and understanding right so that's how knowledge and mind um, works and comes about in history so thesis antithesis synthesis new thesis Hegel famously conceived of this as the master-slave dialectic. Over time, the master comes to know to have no knowledge of how to perform labor. He relies entirely on the slave. Once the slave realizes this, he can dominate the master. Slavery is then itself obliterated. For Hegel, history is rational and progressive. History is just mimicking and following the Christian God, um, trying to understand um, his own self. So I should note that Hegel's thought is important for literature here. Um, I mentioned this above with tragedy because it's partly an updating of Aristotle's notion of tragedy and sacrifice. The modern novel, if we think back to novels from the 1800s, um, uh, as a medium expresses the notion of the character and reveals the character's progression through um, building towards spirit. Um, so, uh, the, sometimes this is called the enlightenment novel, right? Or the Bildungsroman, right? Um, if we think about that literary form, um, that's kind of a way of, of, of expressing like what Hegel means by something like notion is we're getting the whole picture and the whole process of development itself, um, as we come into a force of understanding. So thus the modern tragic hero is not the one of nobility who falls from grace in the way that Aristotle explains it in classic tragedy, nor an exalted, um, a, a, the modern hero um, doesn't fall from grace or an exalted social position, but someone who's working through the developmental, the development of a moral sensibility that transcends the state. The state is an apparatus, and this is of course like very difficult to think about right now in a in a brief lecture on Hegel, um, but but the state um, as Hegel conceives it is an app as an apparatus, is the enables the normative legal procedure to secure individuals in their freedom to move toward grace, even if it is by way of a Protestant conception of work, the state imposes moral structures on the individuals, um, uh, um, which may be sensitive to spirit or so that they may be sensitive perhaps to spirit. In that sense, the state is a machine of grace in Hegel. The state is a good thing, The state and the state is a Christian thing. The state is what comes about through the evolution of Christian history as the most rational entity in order to help us be better Christians. Um, so uh, the sovereign in this scheme moves um, from the stand-in for Christ, 
um, in his earth or in his two bodies, right? The, the king is dead, long live the king, um, to the empty throne of liberalism, um, uh, which some have recently interpreted as liberalism's weak messianism, that like that at the end of the basis, we don't have some sort of strong dictator in liberalism. What we have is an empty throne and a weak kind of messianism, an absent God, if you will. Uh, at the heart there, whereas perhaps like the totalitarians or something, they they need the tyrant to have the tyrant there. And so they're less evolved in this thinking. Um, nostalgia for strong sovereigns develops from a fear that the grace machine is not working properly for the moral and spiritual conduct of persons towards spirit. Meanwhile, those charismatic and sensitive individuals who move beyond the imposed moral structures of the state come to inhabit a new world. They have benefited from the grace of the state and transcended it. They've become what I call in one of my books, enchanted citizens, not merely cosmopolitan in an enlightenment sense, but having developed both their rational and moral capacities embraced a kind of gnosis um, that the state alone cannot provide, but only facilitate liberal access to. They in a sense become above the law is a way to think about it. And this is definitely not just in Hegel. We have a similar idea in John Stuart Mill that it is only the civilized people that um, uh, have become citizens and become educated through a citizenry apparatus that is partly benefited by the state. Um, uh, it is not just Native Americans, for example. This is part of like why the, the liberals invent the boarding school system for indigenous peoples, because they need to habilitate the so-called sav savage to um, uh, the norms of Christianity. They need to Christianize them first, give them a Christian education, and only after that can they have equal rights, right? And of course, that whole process is genocidal um, for how it actually works for indigenous peoples, right? Um, so this, it is built in to the philosophy here. And once we understand that this is part of a grander concept that is not just... Um, you know, Christian in the sense of like, oh, that's a Christian down the street. They believe in this certain thing. It's an entire worldview of thinking about how progress and the development of the world is going to come to be. And if that means wiping out other peoples, then so be it for them. Um, for Kant, for example, um, he saw the dying out of non-Christian peoples as inevitable. Um, he also said that that didn't mean that you needed to go like... Um, uh, um, destroy all of them in a bloody battle. He would just said that they will sort of die out. So this is all built in. Genocide is built into um, the idea of this this uh, bureau Christian civilization. Um, and it continues today, of course. Um, New Age liberalism, I feel like, owes a lot to Hegelian thought. A lot of emphasis on mysticism that we don't even frame in terms of believing in Christianity, for example, right? But it nevertheless draws on these theological ideas that are mystical, um, that are in, in existence with Hegel, the idea that I am part of God and that we are all sort of following God in some sort of um, um, mass um, transmigration of souls or something like that. Um, definitely mystical concepts. In broader European thought, we can roughly regard this philosophy as a turn towards subjectivity of subjectivity of the individual. Even though there will be important nuances between philosophers, between Kant and Hegel, yes, there are important differences, even though they're both Euro-Christians. It is foundational to the idea of modernity, though, on this idea of an inward or subjective turn. Yes, we can see it earlier, the earlier impulse in um, a thinker like Italian humanism, with, like with Dante or the Protestant Reformation, which creates an, uh, an emphasis on the self and the individual's relationship with the divine or the Copernican Revolution, um, uh, in which we don't see the um, earth as the center of the universe, but the earth goes around the sun um, and that disrupts an idea top-down order of king on top or king standing in for God, the divine rights of kings, all of that kind of stuff. All of these are part of the general Western European narrative focusing on an inward or subjective turn. You can look at it in Hamlet in Sh by, from Shakespeare. Oh God, I could be bounded in a nutshell and count myself a king of infinite space. <clears throat> 
were it not that I have bad dreams. So he, that's why people look back on this character and they think, oh, he's like Hamlet is perhaps the first modern character because of his anxieties about all of this kind of stuff and his inability to act because of his anxieties. Um, in René Descartes in 1641, the Me Meditations on First Philosophy, of course, the famous Cogito Ergo Sum, I think, therefore I am. We can see all of this is part of the same process. German culture is different than French culture. French culture is different than English culture. They all are generally Christian, whether Catholic or Protestant, and they might fight each other, but they have with them a Euro-Christian worldview. Worldview then is deeper than culture. It's deeper than one particular language, right? Um, they all agree that they can colonize other places in the world that are not Christian, um, uh, both the Protestants and Catholics, although the Catholic papal bulls of um, the, the 15th century are definitely the most articulate forms of saying that that Christians can go take over other places in the world that aren't inhabited by Christian princes. The young Hegelians, to come back to like, so Hegel has set up all of this stuff. Hegel's operating in a process that, uh, that many Euro-Christians are doing. He's got a really advanced philosophy. He says that the state does this kind of habituating thing that helps us become Christians. And this is where the break is going to be with the young Hegelians. They're left-leaning critics who saw Hegel's concept of history as pointing towards a change. They can see that he's that if so they follow him and his concept of history to a certain extent. In particular, though, they were critical of the Christian religion. Um, David Strauss um, uh, had had written a controversial historical account of Jesus Christ that denied Christ's divinity. This was published in 1835. Remember, Hegel had died in 31. Hegel had posited the state as a progressive force in Christian history, but a political turn in, um, in 1840, sorry, not 1940, um, uh, in 1840, uh, that restricted freedom of speech and religious tolerance tolerance led the young Hegelians to radicalize even more and to say that Hegel must have been wrong by attributing either, either he's wrong at saying that the state is this Christian, like, entity that will make us into better Christians, or um, he's wrong, Christianity itself is 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 wrong because it hasn't enabled further freedom. It's instead um, enabled um, more oppression. This is where we get Ludwig Feuerbach and his Essence of Christianity, which is published in 1841, um, coming in. Um, so he synthesized in that book much of this impulse. It's a lesser excuse me, it's a lesser read book than um, uh, uh, someone like Marx. And, and we don't, he, Feuerbach definitely doesn't have the, 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 the big name status that somebody like Marx has. Um, and, but he's nevertheless really, really important for thinking about, about this and not just important for Marx, but for others as well. So if we look briefly at Feuerbach's famous book, The Essence of Christianity, um, one of the things that he starts talking about in this book is the idea of humanity's species being. We start thinking of humanity as a whole. This was part of a general turn towards the analysis of society or groups of humans as a whole in the 19th century. Um, uh, Euro and Euro-Christians throughout Europe are, are doing this kind of turn, not from the, just towards the individual, but towards groups. Um Euro-Christian thought um, here is kind of opposed to the Enlightenment's emphasis on the individual rational subject. So that's just kind of a shift. Um, and it happens with the with liberalism, right? It happens with John Stuart Mill and utilitarianism. It's not just Marx and communism. Um, this is just part of the phenomenon of 19th century philosophy. Um, so Feuerbach wrote, um, religion has disappeared and for it has for it has been substituted even among Protestants, the appearance of religion, the church, or in, in order at least that, quote, the faith may be imparted to the ignorant and indiscriminating multitude. Again, think of colonization there. The faith being still the Christian 
because the Christian churches stand now as they did a thousand years ago, and now as formerly as the external signs of faith are in vogue. That which has no longer any existence in faith, the faith of the modern world is only an ostensible faith, a faith which does not believe what it fancies that it believes, and is an is only an undecided pusillanimous unbelief. Um, uh, that kind of faith um, uh, is faith is still to pass as current opinion. That which is no longer sacred in itself, in truth, is still at least to seem sac sacred. So modern Christians do not believe, do, they do not have the faith of the old Christians, or they believe that is one faith among others, as Charles Taylor puts it in a, his recent book, A Secular Age, that um, what modernity brings is like, well, I could choose to be this religion or this religion. And now I'm thinking of religion as something that I choose, not something that I'm bound to in the sense that religio, that that Latin word may, um, really, that we get religion for, comes from, is to bind us to something. We're not longer, we're, we're not bound. Instead, we we actively choose this as some part of our identity construct um uh, rather than the way that thing that the world fundamentally is so in contrast to strauss's historical account of jesus feuerbach accepts jesus though as a supernatural human but says that the idea of being superhuman is merely the product of human imagination gods don't create humans humans create gods in order to think themselves as a species gods and religion are in, in general, are but moments in the development of human self-consciousness. So it's not that religion isn't important, right? That's important, although there's some, some critique, especially critique of religion and the state going on um, in Feuerbach, but um, religion has been necessary for humanity um, to come to terms with itself. Um, so to go on here in this longer quote from Feuerbach, Thus man becomes conscious of himself through the object that reflects his being. Man's self-consciousness is his self-consciousness of the object. One knows the man by the object that reflects his being. The object lets his being appear to you. The object is his manifest being, his true objective ego. This is not this is true not only of the intellectual of, of intellectual, but also of sensuous objects. Critical theorists, this is an, an intro to critical theory lecture, um, and Marxists will later use the term reification to designate how an idea becomes realized as an object in the world. Feuerbach is doing an early version of this. He says that consciousness is given when a being is its own object. Consequently, it is nothing by itself and as distinct from a being that is conscious. Well before Freud, then, Feuerbach writes, religion is the, is the essential being of man in his infancy, but the child sees his essential being, namely the man outside himself as a child. A man is object to himself as another man. Hence, the historical development occurring when religion, within religions takes the following course. What an earlier religion regarded as objective is now recognized as subjective. For example, what was regarded and worshipped as God is now recognized as something human. From the standpoint of a later religion, the earlier religion turns out to be idolatry. Man is seen as to have worshipped his own essence. Man has objectified himself, but he has not yet recognized the object as his own essential being, a step taken by a later religion. In my context of German mysticism and an embrace of enchanted pantheism against Spinoza, we can see how Feuerbach is synthesizing multiple trajectories of thought here, not just Hegel's. God becomes something like what Freud would later call the superego, made manifest by uh, the child's encounter with the more perf powerful, quote, man or slash father who gives the law by saying no to the object of desire in the Freudian schema, 
um, which of course in the Freudian schema is the mother. The encounter with the man is the physical reality, but the psychic manifestation within the child is the superior being that the, is the law giving punisher, etc. But the child will, of course, become an adult and overcome the physical interactions by subordinating the other to its own psychic system of self-consciousness and self-objectification, -object quote from Feuerbach. Man progressively appropriates to himself what he had attributed to God. Later, Feuerbach says, the ego then attains to, to consciousness of the world through consciousness of the thou. All of this thought will become common language of identity, later identity politics, um, the I thou of Martin Buber in the 1920s, the I other of existentialism, in, um, and then also of late romantic poets in the late 19th century, like Arthur Rimbaud, who famously said, I is an other. This is all part of this Euro-Christian philosophy. Um, Marx is going to come in here, you know, if it's the, the essence of Christianity by Feuerbach um, has done a lot of interpretive work, a lot of synthesizing work of Hegel's um, situation. Marx is going to come in a few years later with his theses on Feuerbach and he's going to push it further. So in 1845, the theses on Feuerbach, um, uh, uh, which Marx writes when he's drafting the German ideology with his co-writer Friedrich Engels, um, uh, the theses weren't published till after Marx's death, more than 40 years later. Um, Marx notes, though, in his in thesis one, quote, Feuerbach wants sensuous objects re really distinct from from thought objects, but he does not conceive human activity itself as objective activity. Thinking itself must be conceived, for Marx anyway, as physical activity, not a theoretical, theoretical abstraction. In the German ideology, Marx writes, life is not determined by consciousness, but consciousness is determined by life. Marx premises this on the objective fact that humans live in relationship with one another. Again, that emphasis on community, on group. That's part of 19th century philosophy that Marx is participating in that right now. In thesis seven, uh, Marx writes, quote, Feuerbach resolves the religious essence into the human essence, but the human essence is no abstraction inherent in each single individual. In its reality, it is the ensemble of social relations. Consciousness cannot be abstracted from this brute fact, right? We cannot think of consciousness just as an individual, rational, enlightenment-centered self. Consciousness comes from the ensemble of social relations and our interactions with physical people in the actual world, from Marx. He praises Feuerbach for going as far as the theorist can go, but then famously calls on philosophers to change the world. The philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. Or maybe it's not philosophers who are going to change the world. Maybe it's somebody else. Maybe it's sociologists. I have no idea. But he says up to this point in um, uh, in history, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point that Marx wants to emphasize that it is that we need to change the world. We can see that Marxian materialism certainly aspired to be thoroughly scientific in that sense that it aligned 19th century, and, and in that sense, it uh, aligned with 19th century positivism. Um, we want to see and be able to analyze the actual objective conditions that we live in, not the abstractions that we have about them. That's ideology. We might critique and analyze ideology, but we must critique it and analyze it from the sense of that it is produced by actual human social relations. Um, by the time that we get to the critical theorists of the 1920s, we will see that positivism, positivism um, of the 19th century, like 19th century science, had been greatly critiqued through the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the early 20th centuries. One name for this, as I alluded to in my previous lecture on Marcuse, is instrumental reason. Marcuse also noted 
the necessity to do analysis at the level of society in contrast to the bourgeois ideology of individual rationalism. We can see easily that the, there's a Marxian influence here on the critical thinkers, on Marcuse especially. Though many philosophers of the 19th century, as I've said, had already shifted towards social analysis. Marx never gave a definite picture of what communist society would actually look like, so it is left to, do, to debate how much we would have re he would have recognized um, his own thought in endeavors such as the Bolshevik Revolution or the Chinese Cultural Revolution. As we will see in our coverage of the Communist Manifesto in a future lecture, the proletarian revolt is conceived as an entirely organic matter rather than a preconceived program. Clearly, the 20th century efforts to bring about a communist society fell under several charismatic leaders who thought that they could push us towards um, a, a, a real communist society. And that would be like Lenin or Trotsky or Stalin or Mao Zedong or Ho Chi Minh or Che Guevara. Um, uh, the, these are all charismatic figures. While we look at some of these political thinker leaders in future lectures, we, we will look at some of them. My main point in this course at this point is to show that critical theorists were both influenced by Marx and critical of some of the contemporary manifestations of Marxism. It's a gross oversimplification to simply associate critical theory with Marxism, though Marx's thought remains fundamental to understanding the emergence of critical theory. In my le next lecture, I will dig into some basic Marxian terminology as we consider the later 1848 Communist Manifesto. Now, I emphasize this stuff at the end because, as I mentioned in my previous lecture, if we jump into contem contemporary um, critical theory, um, the discussion um, is partly um, a critique of Frankfurt style critical theorists like Her Herbert Marcuse or Max Horkheimer, Theodore Adorno, Walter Benjamin, um, <clears throat> that somehow they gave up on an earlier Marxian influenced revolutionary project and they became themselves kind of uh, bourgeois philosophers, or at least that that's the way that they were received, especially in the United States in discussions of critical theory as it entered universities. So that charge is definitely out there. I just want to make make sure that that's the, the, the that's um, that we're acknowledging that um, on the one hand, um, they, they, they they became less revolutionary as one of the current crit criticisms. Um, another current criticism that's less um, developed <laughs> is just the idea that because we're talking about critical theorists or studying critical theory, we must all just be closet Marxists or we, we just must be Marxists. And that, that somehow, um, you know, like, like if you take a class in critical theory, um, you must already be left-leaning, you must already be um, some sort of radical revolutionary, um, uh, a nihilist, as some of the right-wing critics will be. Um, and I think that that's ridiculous. Um, I think that what we need in an intro to a critical theory class when we're talking about Marx is we need to understand kind of where Marx was coming from. And we also need to understand that for critical theory as it emerged, yes, they're super influenced by Marx. Marx is one of the greatest thinkers of the 19th century and maybe like one of the greatest philosophers and, and, and economists. He's a power, powerful, powerful mind that um, we must deal with and, and encounter. But to encounter Marx and to engage with Marx is not necessarily to deify Marx, right? He only had 11 people at his funeral. <laughs> When Marx dies in 1883, um, it is later people who promote him um, into uh, the ideas that will then emerge into 20th century um, um, global politics. And um, so Marx is super, super important. I cannot emphasize how important he is for um, these thinkers, um, for critical theory in general, but their adherence to the extent that they are adhering to him, because some of the current philosophers critical theorists will say they aren't, 
Um, but to the extent that they are adhering to Marxism, it is not dogmatic necessarily, right? It, um, they're, they're trying to figure out, if anything, they're trying to figure out where um, uh, where Marx was limited in his own thinking. And that, of course, is what pushes the Frankfurt School of theorists towards cultural analysis. Um, and maybe, you know, according to current critics, that gets them off track. That's fine if that's a, a charge that you want to make. But the only reason why they make that charge is because, like, society is not unfolding historically as prettily as maybe Marx had predicted it, and maybe as Hegel had predicted it. Just, just, you know, it, it, by the late eighteen thirties, when the young Hegelians were um, working things out, um, they were seeing that. Hegel's own predictions um, for how society was was following. The Hegel's thought about the state was nece not necessarily a liberatory thing, right? That the state had become a controlling mechanism for them. And so that's why revolution needed to be promoted um, through the proletarian um, and why material history had, had to develop it um, by using some of Hegel's thinking but also by amplifying it um, and, and changing it um, towards a focus on the material instead of the ideal. Okay, I'm gonna stop there. Thank you for watching. If you got, if you're getting um, something out of this, even if you're disagreeing with me um, uh, and you feel like you are able to support us on Patreon, please do so. And we will continue with another lecture on um, the Communist Manifesto by Marx and Engels um, next. Uh, take care and have a good day wherever and whenever you are.